What's up, guys? We're here with uh, Gorilla One on the Space Between. What's up? What's up? Uh, I'm the co-host. Here's our host, Joey Natolo. Hey, what's up, Eddie? How you doing? We have the wonderful privilege today to be here with Esteban Orio. Mm -hmm. Thank you. King of L.A. photography <laughs> and lifestyle culture. <laughs> Soul Assassins. Um, just checked out the, the documentary. Yeah, yeah that's, just, that was sick. Just, like, just coming off a Netflix run with L.A. Originals. Yeah, we had a good one on that. Yeah. How long did you work on that for? Uh, the, I started filming it probably in uh, the mid-90s. And then we were going to try and drop it in the early 2000s. And uh, Brian Grazer, uh, it was between Brian Grazer and and, um, and Lawrence Bender. And Lawrence Bender wanted to do a documentary and Brian Grazer wanted to do a feature. So in order to do the feature, the documentary had to be locked up. So we took 10 years to do the, the uh the feature and then um, it took a couple years for the footage to be released after that so then in 2017 a f I met a guy from Argentina named uh, Sebastian Ortega and he told me hey you want to put out that documentary you know whatever happened when I go I just got the footage back now the rights to everything so he was like, Can, do you mind if, if I do it with you? And I was like, no, let's do it, you know, because after talking to him, he was like the only low rider in Argentina. He was a big time uh, TV and movie exec in Argentina, and, and he's all tatted up, wears uh, T-shirts and Dickies and Chuck Taylors every day. So I was like, you know, this guy gets it, you know, so... I went down to Argentina, looked at his production facility, and I was like, man, we need to do this. So he walked it into Netflix when he got the first rough cut in Argentina, and then they played it for the guys over here, and then it, it, got, a, it got a worldwide release. But at first it was just gonna be for Latin America. That's why if you see any uh, press on it, it looks like it's a film from Argentina. All right. Now, like, just after looking at that, I was talking to Eddie. It's like you guys are really, like, the heartbeat for Chicano lifestyle or lowrider lifestyle. Like, looking at that, I was talking to uh, to Seth when I said you were coming in. He, like, threw on the shirt. He's like, bro, I got to sit down and check this out. Yeah. Just because, like, looking at, like, you know what I mean? Like, the importance of, I think, even talking about those producers you mentioned, that they'd be interested, the, the mass crossover appeal that that lifestyle has had and the influence it's had on like little white kids in Calabasas or you know wherever it goes you know Japan or everywhere you know yeah made it's quite been an like impact that for years you know I mean ever since I can remember um, you know everything always would start in the hood it seemed like you yeah. know like the all the cool stuff and even though kids you know in these places had all the money in the world they couldn't buy that no so they're kind of you know energy is directed to that they want to be the bad boys and you know that kind of stuff so yeah. end yeah. up uh you know leaning towards that way and they get twisted up in the in the hood and you know end up where they end up there's off you know mm -hmm. with their with their parents or you know their position at their parents company that they were going to have or whatever or blowing their you know family's money or whatever so it's it's always uh, been like kind of a thing for the kids out in the, you know these type of areas to not all of them but you know there's some that pick that direction to go to and um, you know everybody sees the the richness in that in the culture in that in those areas you know like there's just so much going on there it's like the the heartbeat of the city yeah like it's it is a heartbeat like straight up it's when people are going in and out like when watching that it's like it's unbelievable to what what it is that you got you tapped into like even not with like not really even like did you realize what you were tapping into when you guys actually like started out in Cyprus and taking you know and shooting these guys what that would turn into we didn't even you know you all know? of us didn't know anything we didn't even know what we were doing you know I was 
I was filming and taking pictures, but not even knowing what I was doing, what I was filming. I didn't know how to use the cameras. I never got training. My dad handed me the camera and he was like, hey man, you should document what you're doing. Cause at that time I was low riding. I was on tour with House of Pain. And he gives me this camera that him and his wife had. And he was like, you know, if you look in the in the viewfinder, there's these two needles, and when they line up, it's ready to shoot. So you have to turn this knob and, and on the lens, and when they match up, you're ready. I was like, all right, cool. So to me, I was like, you know, I don't want to do that because it's like I usually saw like paparazzis and, and tourists with cameras. So I kind of was like, even though I knew there was, a, a, you know, professional guys doing it, the majority of people with cameras were like tourists or paparazzis, you know. So I kind of wasn't really like into it. I was like, yeah, okay, Dad, you know, I'll try it. But then I started taking a couple pictures here and there, like, you know, my homie is low riding, and then when we'd go on tour, and uh, when I'd come back, everybody would be like, hey, let's see, see the photos that you took when we were on tour. Or, you know, the low rider guys would be like, hey, can I get a picture of my car? Yeah, here, because, you know, I go to the one-hour photo place and make everybody the 35-cent photos. And they'd be like, damn, this is bad, you know, like, fuck, you really got it. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, and then <laughs> I would see my other friends' photos from the same <laughs> events we were at. And I'd be like, damn, what were they shooting? Yeah, what like, right? Know. What's yeah. wrong with their, what's wrong with their camera or whatever? I thought it was their camera. I didn't know that, you know, it was the eye, you know? yeah. And then I started like, then I started thinking like, oh, I think I have something different here than what regular people have when they take a photo. And I just started going a little bit harder on it. And, and this lady that worked at the photo lab where I took my photos to, she was like, hey, um, you never print anything. You know, can I make some prints for you? I was like, yeah, sure. Cause I always just had the, um, the contact sheets, the proof sheets that when they make a, develop the film, they give you like a one sheet thing with all the photos, like the strips of the negatives. Yeah. And I had these envelopes in milk crates in the back of my car. That was my office. Me and Cartoon used to roll around in the 84 Cutlass. And I had two milk crates full of contact sheets in the back. And then he had his like, his little box with his pencils and pens and stuff. and. We used to roll around to coffee shops and, you know, chop it up or roll around to like a Kinko's and print shit out and just start brainstorming. So we really didn't know anything we were doing, you know. And then, you know, we we're with the homies from House of Pain and Cypress. Like they were just starting out, too. So they didn't know their music was going to hit or anything. And Cypress took off. And then the next year, House of Pain came out and and when I first took that job with House of Pain, it was for no money. It was like um, expenses. And I used to work, you know, you brought Brent Bolt House. I used to do his door and I did construction during the day and I did other doors at clubs at night. So I was making a decent amount of money for the way I was living. My apartment was 450 bucks a month. You know, I had my car, I didn't have no, I had no bills really. Right. So the amount of money I was making at that time, I was cool, but I gave that up to go work with House of Pain for free, just for the expenses. And then that shit took off that summer. Like that first, that first time we hit the road and we were going to do uh, promotional stuff, the radio station started picking it up and we started doing these little spot date shows and then we got on the Beastie Boy tour and it was over. Yeah. So from the gate, nobody knew what they were doing. We were all fresh, you know, coming into all this type of industry. And at, right out the gate, we all started, like, you know, doing our thing. And that motivated us and pushed us, you know, to work harder. And, you know, we're all kind of competitive. So we all got, like, okay, cool. We're on to something. We got something good. And we just kept pushing it and kept you know pushing each other and and you know we we became like this team that we we're like pumping each other up all the time and and it worked you know yeah so, 
we ended up, I ended up having all this footage and all these photos and I was like man what am I going to do with all this shit now so <laughs> then we thought of well let's do a documentary let's do books and started putting out books and then the documentary thing we made a trailer for 200 bucks and got somebody to edit a trailer showed that to all these people and you know we ended up getting a deal and the rest you know it is what it is now you know it was a lot it was a a good 20 25 plus years of work that we've been putting into it and then we got the 90 minute deal so it was like we had to make like a highlight reel of the 25 years yeah you made it cool for like mickey mouse to throw gang signs and shit right the la i'm kidding yeah i mean yeah. <laughs> i mean that la that was a big deal because that was like people used to kind of like look at that and be like nah like you don't want to do that and the next thing you know that thing was like everywhere yeah now right? there's kids all over the world it's got like i think it's probably the most tattooed photograph in the world because i see like people hit me up every day they're showing me hey i got the i got your photograph tattooed on me and i'm like damn that's crazy you know yeah but it's so cool that people want one of my photos on them for the rest of their life and it's that one you know yeah like there's a lot of photos of marilyn monroe or something like that tattooed on people but it's not the same photo it's like you know yeah different different, different photos yeah. you know 30 different photos different shot but that photo is just, there's only one there's only it's one iconic. of that photo you know yeah but the way i was telling you too the way you capture things because you get anyone from somebody in the gutter in the street you know strung out or whatever to kim kardashian over here you know what i'm saying like the dynamic yeah. and the polarities of what you shoot is what i find to be so fascinating you know like yeah. that's how i grew up i you know but i hid from that shit you know what I mean? But I was able to bounce into the other scene and be like, okay, this is, this is cool. But yeah. my, the, where I was from, because all my friends were Mexican and black, and I lived in a, a pretty interesting neighborhood, you know? So I was able to kind of bounce out of that neighborhood and go to the other one and be like, oh, okay, this is kind of like more casual. I can breathe here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little more tense in this other situation. Yeah. You know? But it was... Uh, it's, it was fascinating watching that um, documentary, and I loved it. I just want to tell you that right off the bat. That was great. Thank What's you. crazy is back in those original days, when I first met you, we were all, I was working with you and him at the same time. And right? Danny Boy was just some skinny kid that I used to like see hanging out like a donut shop. Like, oh, there's that skinny kid again. And that's how No I one met. knew. That's how I met I didn't like him. I'd be like, I swear, we used to get in arguments. I'd be like, fuck, like me and Danny Boy didn't like each other. But he was just like, just, you know, lanky guy that was trying to rap and do some things that I was like this kid ain't gonna make it don't waste your time and then you were like damn he did it but like in the day he was just like he didn't you know what I mean but he didn't stop he kind of just kept going to that donut shop and the fuck he was doing well that. I mean I, I had a different take on Danny when I met Danny I, I seen how talented he was you know he's not the nicest guy in the world but he was talented he could draw yeah he had an eye but it was a different yeah. kind of eye he's the one that came up with the logo he's the one that came up with the name of the band he so actually, like, yeah. yeah, he when did I, all the merch for yeah. the band. Like he designed it. I'm like, you know. And he also had a really unique talent at getting people together, you yep. know, and, and camaraderie and like, you know, Mickey Mouse Club. You know what I mean? Like he just had this thing about him. I just knew it. Like I met him and we became instantly became friends. And then he said, "Hey, you want to go on the road with us?" That was like some. Did you know the Mickey Mouse Club? Like the like a white boy. Yeah, I heard about it. With crew. Like I, that's why. Like I didn't like. To me, my friends would be like, "Nah." But there were some guys there that. We're like, you know, whatever, but my friends were just like, yeah, you know? So I just never, whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dead? We what? lost him. No, I was there. I was just trying to explain about the time <laughs> that I met you. And then he went off about when was it? how whack Mickey Mouse Club was. <laughs> um, I said, Danny said, do you want to go out on but, the road with me? And I was like, nope, for no money. I got to, what, 320 in per diem? Yeah. And we got picked up at 5.30 in the morning, and we pulled up to Las Palmas in the white van. Yeah. And it was me, Eric, Lee. Gator wasn't even out then. It was me, Eric, and Lee, and you were the last stop. Yeah. And you came down with your shit and got in the, in the, in the van, and it was like, you're going to be working for him. And I was like, okay, and we didn't know each other, but, yeah. I mean, instantly on the road, it was like, we, you know, we were... We kicked it harder than I kicked it with them because it was different. Yeah. They were different. They were yeah. doing their own thing. They were the guys in the, on the stage. 
Yeah, and I, and you actually, I wanted to be a photographer after the first tour with you because you were just always shooting photos. I used to go by the Insta, Insta, Insta ones, yeah. and we'd be at the one hour photo every stop. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. We had a good time. Yeah, I want to see those pictures. Yeah, you got, you I, mean, got I sent you a couple. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you probably got some good ones up. I do. I remember one time I left my camera in his room. He was ironing his T-shirt. And I was like getting bored. I'm like, I'm going to go downstairs now. And I left my camera in his room. And he said, oh, you left your camera in room. So we went to the one hour photo and I got the camera roll back. And it wasn't a contact sheet. It was actual photos. And I look and there's a picture of a turd in a toilet bowl. And I'm like, these, they went and shot a picture of a turd in a toilet bowl on my camera. And he's laughing at me. I'm like, let's go back, man. I got to go say something. He's like, no, you can't do that. I go, why not? He goes, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> It was funny. That, 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 that's what they called. That was the shit, right? <laughs> that was that's the what shit. They kept saying that's the shit. <laughs> but yeah, we had some good times on the road. Which you know, when I was watching the documentary, it reminded me of a lot of because a lot of that stuff I was there for, like Spotlight with cartoon. Yeah, that's where I got all my cartoon tattoos. But I mean, and one thing I think is interesting how you say we had no idea what we were doing because you don't, you you had no idea where it was going to take you, did you? No, I'd never been a road manager before. You know, Muggs told me, yeah, you just go with them and check them in the hotel, make sure they get to the interviews on time, and when you guys do shows, you just make sure everything gets set up. I was like, yeah, cool, and then I just gotta do that? Yeah, no problem. And little did I know, I was just gonna be an accountant, a security, DJ a tech. dad. DJ. I think DJ one of the tech. other Davids, the 45 Davids that you know, is David Kim. Do you know David Kim? Donut. I'm gonna have to check him out. Donut. Do you know, you know what I'm talking about? David Kim, the big, the big Korean Donut, dude? He was security for Limp when we were out on the Napster tour. He was a big, big, he's a big old dude. Korean dude. But he, he also used to work for Brent Bullhouse. No, he's a but he also worked for Brent Bullhouse. You know used to have that big Cadillac? I probably know him if I saw him. Yeah. yeah you know That's the other sure. thing with that job. I met thousands of people, and I just, there's no way in the world to you remember can remember him. everybody, and this, they just stuck out like that. Yeah. Know, that hard, because. I mean, we met hundreds of people on the daily, you know, like imagine that for 20 15 years, years you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Who gave you your first camera, your pa? Yeah, my dad and his wife, they had an extra one, so they were like here. And then I, uh, it was a Minolta. Low battery. Low battery. For what? <laughs> it's the mic. So, so your dad, your da who gave you your first, who gave you your first, your first camera? Your dad? Uh, my dad and his wife. Yeah. It was a Minolta, and then um, when I got um, you know, got a little money, I went and bought a Canon A1, and I went to give them back that camera, and they're like, no, no, you keep it. So I still have that. It's like memorabilia, and then uh, since then, I probably bought like 25, 30 Canon A1s, because I put them to, you know, put them to use. They're like, like Timex, you know, they take a licking and keep taking. Yeah. So they're, they're pretty durable cameras, you know, I drop them, they get beat up and, um, it's cheaper to buy a new one than to get them fixed. Yeah. And the guys are like, yeah, we can fix it. Just a couple hundred bucks. I'm like, cool. I'll buy one off, offline for 50. Do you ever have like kids, like young kids coming up to you that want to start shooting? You know what I mean? That live in the city that, yeah, cause that's there's a lot of every day. Yeah. Maybe every day they want to, you know, but that's, you know, I, I want to give back and do all that. And I do do that, but it's draining how much people want from me, you know? Yeah. Like they're just like, they just want me to stop my life to make theirs. You know, I'm like, come on, you know, like you got to do something, you know, you got to make some type of effort and shit, you know, yeah. you come in like moping around and fuck on my like, hey, bro. I can't even do do all that right now, you know. Like looking at your face, moping around. I gotta, I gotta keep it moving. Like <laughs> that makes me want to go jump off a bridge or something. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. But the, yeah, but there's a thing, you know, having young guys come up that you know that when you leave that you you know you pass a little bit of that craft off. There's not many that can do it. You yeah. know, there's be the you might have you know there'd be one dude that's gonna be your guy that comes out that's successful. Speaking of, look who walks in. There yeah, is so one one dude. Yeah. yeah, and that's well, all it did. Like, like, but look what you look at the one no. D. What it did. No. Nope. All right. But yeah, you if know. you think of what you as one dude right yeah. did, 
like if you actually look at it, if you step outside of it, like it really kind of like, that's why I said, I, I felt like the heartbeat of that lifestyle. Cause when I looked at it, I was like, wow, he, he hit it, you know, and on, on every angle and how you did it, not knowing, it's probably the beauty of it was not knowing, yeah. going in just fucking, for sure, like, definitely. you know, dog patch wino, like I'm going in, you know? And then you just, and it created, you created like a movement. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's definitely, uh, it was a, a plus, you know, not not knowing what I was doing. And, Cause you know, I came at it in a different way, you know? I yeah. Was, you know what I, you know what I always used to see was like, they have the, the guardrails, right? For the stage and press gets first two songs or three songs, right? Yeah. And when he would get in there, you, you would shoot it different. Like dudes would get in there and just capture the shot. Like, Oh, I got Everlast. That's it. I'm out of here. And Esteban would be climbing all over him, like getting, you know what I mean? Just getting different angles. Yeah. And I'd be like, wow, he's in there like really getting it, not just trying to get the shot for the local or for the, you know, for the, yeah. at the time there was no gram. So it was like, but literally they would get their staple shots, the band together, close up a Lee, Eric a couple times, Danny. And then yeah. they're like, well, I, my job's over. You know what though? There's a, I, I'm telling you, there's a spiritual understanding because besides having an eye, there's times where he just knows when to grab people. Like, how would he just know the certain time when they grab certain people and click that thing off and people go and everybody respond to that? Yeah, that's his guide. You know, like that's not, you know what I mean? Like, because like you said, I have 10 other people. I look at my camera and I look at my son when he shoots and I'd be like, fucking you shake mine. And I go, doesn't do what his does. Yeah. Because he's a shooter. He's really, he's a talented guy. But, you know, it's similar, you know, like you just have something else that's beyond the eye. Because that, that when they, when you showed the, uh, I think it was Blink, and I think it was like one of their last shots they took together in the, in the documentary, yeah, yeah. and you just kind of went, hey, hey, come here, and you grabbed them, stuff like that. The timing, it's besides the eye, it's the understanding of the timing of everything coming together at that time and capturing it. Yeah, the moment's important. Well, how about that moment with Al Pacino and De Niro? Remember that one? Yep. You yeah. had to do it right at that moment. Yeah, I'll never forget that one. Tell yeah, us They about gave that. me like uh, the whole story? Yeah, the, the short version. Yeah. Okay. The short version is um, once me and Cartoon got up on our feet and started working, you know, we had people working with us. Like we had partners that would go in and do the negotiating. We like to call them, you know, we had our white guy. So we had our white guy that would go into these meetings and, you know, they'd get all the, the meeting going for us and then we would just come in and do the artwork because, you know, it was different when we'd come into a meeting or when we'd have somebody go in and represent us. You know, it's it's a lot easier for us to, you know, to put our price out there. Like, you don't want to be haggling with the, the client, you know. Yeah. So we'd always have our guy that would come in and let him do that, you know. And he could come back to us and say, hey, they want to pay you this. And we're like, no, put on another, you know, another couple zeros on there. So there was a meeting for this movie righteous kill that where they wanted cartoon to do a skateboard for rob dyrdek because he was in the movie and i was like cartoon came back and he's like hey man they want me to do a skateboard for rob dyrdek you know for this movie with al pacino and robert de niro i was like oh okay and my head just went we're about to explode you know like whoa we're gonna do our company's gonna do a project with you know Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, but it's not them, you know. Like we need to do those guys, and so we told our partner like, "Hey, why don't you pitch?" Because at that same time, um, Shepard Ferry had done a alternative marketing poster for uh, the Johnny Cash movie. Walk the line. Walk yeah. the line. So there was the real one, and then they had this one that that Shepard Ferry had done and I was like we need to do that for this movie but we need to do it of Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and their and our partner was like no you know you're kind of you know stepping out of your bounds you know like you're going too high you know like let us just do let's just do the skateboard that's what they want I was like the skateboard is cool but like I've been watching these dudes movies for 30 years like we need to get at them, you know, like right now is our chance, you know, to to get our idols, you know, people that we looked up to. So I told Cartoon, hey, when you go to that meeting, you know, just drop, just throw it out there, you know, see what they say. And he's like, yeah, I got this, you know. So 
I was like, we can't let those guys just slip through our fingers. And, right. you know, this is our one chance. When we might never get it. So he pitched it. And they said, well, we had already we already shot the movie poster. But if you guys want to do a spec movie poster, you know, like a free thing. And, you know, if it gets picked up, then you get paid later. We could do that. And I was like, okay, cool. So he told him, um, why don't I draw something of them for that poster? And but you give me some photos, you know, or or I can have my my partner do it. So they go, oh, we we shot a lot of photos, you know. So we'll we'll give you some photos. And and uh, and they he came back and he goes, hey man, you know, I tried to pitch you to do the photos, but they're like, you know, we already have a bunch of photos of them. We don't need any more new ones. So I was like, fuck, what can we do now? And he, so we were looking through the photos and we were like, these are, you know, these are not that great. Tell them that, you know, go back and have a meeting with them and tell them you need me to do it because you couldn't find nothing on these photos that, that they have. So he went back and told them, you know, I, I looked through the photos, they're not that great. And she, they are like, yeah, well, you know, we kind of felt the same way, but you know, maybe we can send your guy, maybe we can't, we don't know because we're finished shooting. And then there was a makeup day where they had to sh reshoot. Right. And they sent me there. And it was like on a Tuesday that they were going to shoot Robert De Niro and Thursday that they are going to shoot Al Pacino and I was going to go shoot one and one and then put them together on the, you know, on the photo and then we'd do this, uh, you know, cartoon would draw it and it, that would be the poster. So I get there on the Tuesday and I wait there for eight hours and the guy, the director goes, hey, come on, on the shoot, you know, get your shot of Robert De Niro. So I go in there and the, it was lit to where they were, when they were sitting down, it was lit for that. So, but I needed him standing up. So when I stood him up, there was no lighting on him. So it was like garbage lighting. So I shot one photo, you know, just one thing just to make them cool. And then I was just going to wait till they were done and moved them to another place outside. Wait there eight hours, didn't take no pictures. And then I, I left and I was like, hey man, I told my part, one of my partners, I was like, hey, I didn't get the shot. You know, he goes, what do you mean? You were there eight hours. I go, yeah, they didn't let me shoot. You know, they didn't let me do my thing. He So he tells them and it goes out an email to 60 people. Like, you know, everybody at the movie theater, or everybody at the movie company, the productions and all that. And I was like, man. They got me good on this one, you know. They're like, Esteban did not get the shot. <laughs> and, I like, <laughs> and I was like, to me, it looked like uh, all I saw. Yeah, that's all it said. Like, Esteban no, did not up. get the shot. <laughs> you know, like there was like a couple sentences, but it, to me, it's just like big letters that said Esteban fucked up. Right. So I told my wife, I was like, hey, man, they, and she goes, and, and what? So what? Go back there tomorrow and get the shot. I was like, I can't just go back there tomorrow. Said, well, you were standing there eight hours and you didn't get the shot. I go, no, nope. you know, I couldn't, you know, what do you want me to do? Go up and grab him in a headlock and be like, hey, Robert, you know, I need to get this picture. She's like, yeah, that's what you need to do. And I was like, well, you know, I didn't do it. And she goes, okay, so are you going to quit now or, or are you going to go back tomorrow and get the thing? <laughs> and I was like, you know, she's I, sending you back in. Yeah, Angel, like right? I shot, Angel's not playing. Right? They're shot, like wondering who's the tough one. She's like, she sent yeah, me back in. Yeah, I went and shot uh, Dennis Hopper like two years before, and um, when I shot him, I was like, hey, if I ever got to shoot Robert De Niro and Al Pacino now, I could quit. So she threw that in my face, like, hey, man didn't you say if you shot these two guys you could quit i go yeah and she goes well there you're standing right next to me you didn't take no pictures of them so what's up with that and i was like fuck and i was pissed you know i called my partner back and i go hey man tell them i'm coming back tomorrow he goes, <laughs> tell them i'm coming yeah. back he goes what do you mean i go he goes you you missed the shot and i go no no call them up Tell them I'm coming back tomorrow. I'll get the shot tomorrow. I go, don't ask them. Tell them. Like, you know, not in a bad way. Just be yeah, like, yeah. hey, Esteban, you know, is going to come back tomorrow. He's, you know, got the f day, day free. He's going to come and shoot. They go, oh, great. They'll both be there tomorrow. He can do them together. I'm like, well, fucking, why didn't they set that up right. before? Like, <laughs> right, hey, yeah. you know, why they yeah, do happened? all this drama Tuesday and the Thursday and all that shit? 
the next day I go I'm there six hours it's freezing it's in Culver City and it's like cold out that day and I had went to Sammy's and bought an extra camera for a backup just in case my camera messes up <laughs> and I I go they're like hey where's that guy I want to take the pictures and the two doors open up and there comes like 30 people with Al and Bobby in the front I go, yeah, I'm right here. And they go, you ready? I go, yeah, I'm ready. So I pick up my one camera, try to shoot. It doesn't fire off. And I was like, man, I'm so lucky. I went to Sammy's and bought this brand new one. I pick it up. It doesn't fire. And I was like, I started thinking like, this isn't, you know, this isn't happening, you know? So I go in my backup camera. I got my third one. It's this big, huge Pentax 6.7. And, the, and it fires off. And Al Pacino's like, hey, I like that one. That's great. You know, that's, you know, that's a, that's a good camera right there because it's loud. It's like, <laughs> it's like clicks, you know. Yeah. Like, I like that's that. Like, that's, like, you know, that's great. So I, I got like, started to shoot him. I shot off like two or three frames and they go, okay, put Bobby in there. Got him in there and I shot like 15 frames all together and they go, all right, thank you. Like, and I was like, what do you mean? Like, you know, I was like four minutes already. Like, okay, thank you. We got to go to the next set. And I was like, fuck, man. I don't think I got it, you know? And I ran the film to the lab. I go, I got to sit here and watch you guys do this because this is the most important role of film I ever shot in my life. And they're like, yeah, okay, well, if you want, you know, we've done thousands of rolls of film for you, but if you want to sit here and watch this one, you know, go ahead. So I was like, yeah, please, you know? And I saw it and I was like, I got it. And I went and called my partners. I was like, I, hey, I got the shot. And they're like, okay, good. And they ended up choosing the photo as being the, the Main poster. Main poster, yeah. That's funny because that's Main a cover. Cartoon did the logo. Our friend Patrick Martinez laid it out and ended up being on every bus bench, every bus, all the billboards, the DVD cover. And it worked out, you know? I but attribute that to your divine timing, like what I said before. That's a perfect example of just like that moment. Yep, you yeah. being able to find moments to where like even you didn't even realize three minutes yeah. you got what you needed with two two defunct cameras. The third one that clicked real loud was the was the charm. Yeah, right. And then those two <laughs> guys like the like one guy's moving like this and the other guy's like this. So I had to like time it to where like <laughs> they were like both like moving and like perfectly. You got this thing like, like this. <laughs> yeah, it was exactly like that. Yeah, that's funny. But uh, that was it, you know. After that, I was like, man, I could, I could quit now, you know. I shot both of them in one shot. And then the bills came in the mail. I was like, well, maybe not, you know. Maybe I can't quit. Yeah, so <laughs> no doubt. I had to keep going. And I just said, man, I'm just going to go hard now, you know. Yeah. That should just gave me, like, Superman juice, you know. For sure. That I ended up getting to shoot something that, I never thought I could do. So what was the name of that movie? It was uh, Righteous Kill. Was that Randall Emmett? Was he the producer? I'm not too sure. I don't actually think he was. It was it. him and Fifty Cent. In yeah, it. it was Randall Emmett. Yeah. That shot that uh, that produced that. That's your boy. That was yeah. Well, I know. I mean, it was when Johnny Mesner was talking. Yeah, about. that's what I'm. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. That's why I said that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So what's another one of those things that's like, what, what, what could you do now that would make you quit? Nothing. You done it all? Nope, nothing will make me quit. Okay. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna work till I'm in the grave and I just, I love doing it, you know? Would you now consider, now that looking back, would you consider those shots the most important shots of your life? Or, or now what would you say are the, the ones that were the most important to you looking back now that changed? Uh, I would say all of them. All of them. combined because there's no one job that's made me that's made me period like um, I did a job with Blink 182 it was my biggest music video ever and everybody was telling me oh you made it now once you as soon as this video comes out you're gonna be you're it's, it's gonna be over for you you're gonna go through the roof and I was like okay cool and um that budget was definitely the biggest budget I've ever had. And the next one was the lowest budget I ever had. Not ever, but I mean in that yeah, industry. In the category, yeah. So it was like, and I went from the biggest band on the label to the brand new band that 
was coming out my very next job like what everybody was telling me is I was going to go from that one to the you know bigger and bigger and bigger the record label calls me and they're like hey uh, you know you did so good on that video that was great um, and can you do a favor for us and I was like yeah of course you know like you guys gave me this big opportunity what, whatever you need we need to do a video for this band I was like cool no problem and they're like yeah but um, you know here's the budget and I was like oh <laughs> oh, man, you know, like, there was, like, my starting out budgets, you know, I was like, dang, you know, what happened to, I was going to be the next, the, biggest guy the next there, big guy, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. Are you yeah. developing right now, any film projects right now? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm always, you know, on the grind. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I just, I don't feel good unless I'm out there doing something, working, you know? Yeah, it's just that, that. Like it's kicking it, so much, yeah. yeah, hanging out and stuff is cool, but I just get too anxious, you know. Like I like the nature and everything, but I can go there for about a week and then I got to get back into the city, you know. I got to see like movement, I got to smell like city, you know, I got to see some, you know, you buses skid go roll. by, yeah, I got to yeah. drive by skid the driver's like, trucks beeping and I got to hear some life, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. For just sure. Out there hearing the birds and just complete silence is like, okay, cool, this is good. Like, this is good for a couple of days. And then I just start getting anxious. I go, okay, I gotta go. Yeah. Hit hit the city. Like, I, when I hit like New York or Tokyo or something where there's just like nonstop action, I just, I come back to LA fired up. Like, you know, I get like some energy from that. I think, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot of different things to do as far as, like, say, meditative places you can put yourself, but being in a city, because everyone thinks, oh, you have to go out and be in silence, but everyone doesn't have the opportunity to be in silence. Like, if you live in the hood, you have to find places in within your situation that you could find that Yeah, you that plug place. in the source. You know, whether it's, you know, if it's photography, if it's skating, you know what I'm saying? Because my mom used to send me to the beach, because she said that will keep you out of trouble. You know, so that the ocean really kind of was the thing that, for the most part of things, would kept me out of trouble. You know what I mean? Because it was yeah. the water, and it was, you know, because when I went back into the the neighborhood, that's when I would get in trouble. Yeah. You know, always. That's for sure. So these, you know, whatever little spots that they they have for, and the reason why I say that is just because of, you know, going through the experience I went through and and being like, the, like I felt like I'm a typical dude, right? And there's all these other kids that have these experiences end up in prison, you know, and there's then from there, then drugs. And I, I, you know, my friends or me would just bang back and forth between these places. And so I think ultimately looking at like hindsight now and having kids and looking back at it going, like, fuck, how would I have shaped this or would want to do it differently? If so my kids have a different, you know, or have a different, they have a choice to choose, you know, I'll go this way, I'll go that way. Yeah. Because either way, like I don't like telling people. Like, Eddie came over the other day. He's pissed off. I need your help. I'm about to fuck somebody up. I'm gonna do some shit right now. Not I'm Eddie. Like, so, Eddie came Eddie in hot. Did that? He came in hot, <laughs> I and I was like, so I said, let's sit down. For he a took second. me to the beach. I said, so what's up? And he was pissed, right? And like you know, you get mad like that. I don't be telling people what not to do. I just so just look up in the air and take a deep breath. And I go, just know it's up to you what you do right now. What you change in that guy's life, whatever you do is up to you completely. Yeah. Right? It's a decision that you make afterwards is how, what you have to deal with and how you live with yourself. And after we sat down and talked about it, I don't know, you know, he, it seemed like he changed his, his, his view on what well, he I felt did. he I wanted to do. For me, it was the whole thing that I have control over it because when someone's getting over on you, you feel like you have no control. I mean, at least myself. So I felt, go, you know? I felt punked. I felt like the outcome's not up to me, but I know I can do this, and that outcome is definitely up to me. And then I was like, but when you said that, it kind of let me know that like I can also not do that, and that's up to me. And I kind of just like eased up off it, you know, and I kind of let it go. I went outside and I shook it off. And then we went to the beach and we had a short meditation. And I felt at ease knowing that I can either hurt this fool or I can just keep it moving, keep it pushing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do nothing. And it was nice. It felt nice to just not, to know that I could or couldn't. 
And what about your money? Did you get it? <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, I didn't Let's get, get back. The money. <laughs> yeah, did but you get the money? Fine. What about the no, money? No, but you actually <laughs> did. Said that the guy called back and had and a little said bit he's more. Pay me. And said he's to watching me. this right now. I'm sorry, homie. Now you know what's up. <laughs> no, um, but that's better. Because there's a good chance he's going to watch this. But it's fine. You know. I think that's it's it's so important. Like like that decision. That's I think a lot of decisions people make and end up going fuck, and then they they have to live with those decisions they make. So I think a lot of time is having more self-awareness when you make these decisions. And not, wh what I'm saying is too is, if you someone comes and asks me, I think there's messages, there's things that you learn from bad shit. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So say you did, I don't know what it is, God will make that decision, but ultimately something will be learned from the bad and the good, Yeah. you know? So everybody trying to preach, do this, do that, the world be perfect, blah, blah. It's a polarity place. This is why things happen like that, so that there's other people that can there's a, a counterbalance to yeah, it. Yeah, like Michael Beckwith said, it doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. Right. You just have to figure out what that means. For sure. I'm, I'm so stoked you came in, bro, and, and uh, brought your, your everything. For sure. I appreciate it. I, I, uh, I, I enjoy stepping into the world because I grew up in, in a, an interesting place like that. Mm -hmm. And it feels comfortable to me. Um, like real comfortable, like my whole life. Like I never thought I'd have money my whole life. You know, like then all of a sudden I did. I was like, this is a trip. I yeah. was, I never, like I was out of holy shoes and just lived the way that I lived growing up. So it does, uh, it's just such a, like, it was great to watch it. I mean, even to see, you know, Seth trip on it, you know, because of, he grew up with a car club, Dukes, was it called, you know? And when he saw it, he was like, wow, like this is amazing. Like he, you know what I mean? like. It really was um, inspirational in what you did, and, and and you know a lot of people just that whole the understanding of what you took and the office the, the how do you say authenticity authenticity was was like on point, you know like people like happy they'll appreciate that stuff you know and that yeah. work that work that was done, you know and how beautiful it is and. <laughs> Yeah, those were the days, man. I mean, you know, the one thing for me that I always kind of go back to when I think about what we were doing, and I wasn't doing what you were, we were all doing our own level, right? But it, it gives hope It gives hope to younger kids that are, you know, Fuck that yeah. might not think there's a way out of the neighborhood or might not think that there's anything other than selling dope or gangbanging or hustling or whatever the, the call of the day is for where they are in their life. But when they look at people like you in Cartoon and other people that we're close to, they're like, oh, I can actually go do something, you know? And th and I mean this before it was cool to be like us. Now now it's cool. You see it everywhere in urban yeah. outfitters. You know, there's a whole area dedicated to being, you know, from the street. But it's like... It's like what Snoop did, like NWA, or not like but Snoop and NWA. I feel like like that's what you did. Yeah, for like sure. Like a Chicano 100%. lifestyle, like big time. Like it's, that's what I would kind of be, would be the... Because when you started low riding, there wasn't a whole bunch of clubs. It was like way more limited. Now it's like there's so many clubs across the the, the globe, right? Yeah, there was, you know there was a good amount, but there was like two. It feels like there was like three waves of low riding, like the '70s, '80s, set late '70s, early '80s, then the '90s, and then the late 2000s, like like the past. Let's say six years maybe it's just been off the hook. Before the COVID, I think it was the biggest it's ever been. Yeah. Like every you know, now it's spread out in the world and all the events they were jam packed and like there was so much low riding in the streets and you know, not too much in the in those um, you know, fixed areas like the you know, the car shows and stuff. Cause yeah. those are people are kinda bored of those, you know, going and setting up your car and just sitting there all day long and you know it's fun here and there but for me it's it's a car you know I want to drive it I want it to be in the street yeah, have you seen that thing that that entertainment based ride that they're doing on Thursdays or whatever no with fuzzy in them I saw it on spectrum I guess it's something where a bunch of entertainers are getting together and low riding from all you know different hoods and sets and you know, I mean, no, I'll be there yeah. Like a Shaq was, was Shaq rolling with like Snoop, like I saw yeah, that. Snoop yeah, Snoop goes and Fuzzy Fantabulous is there. I can't remember the dude that started it, but he's like... Get a, me in. Yeah, we, I, I thought about you when I was there. Like, let's Put roll. me on the list. Get paid, Big Page to come out. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? I'll hit it. Yeah. Well, right on, bro. Yeah, Thanks for coming birthday, out. birthday, by the way. Soul Assassins. Yeah. Big page. Yeah, man. So, uh, what else? We want to talk about Joker. What? When, what, what? Like, oh, how yeah. did you go from, like, taking photos and, like, you know, documenting it all to putting it on apparel and becoming a huge brand globally? Like, what was that like? Um, we'd been doing clothing since 1992. Um, me and uh, Big Lucky, we used to work, you know, I, I uh, had this job doing construction and we needed more guys, so I brought in Big Lucky and a couple other friends of mine. And we were working at a guy who had a bunch of stores on Melrose, his house. And that guy was like, after he got to know us, he's like, hey, man, I like what you guys are doing. You guys are pretty cool. You know, can we do, I want to open a store with your flavor. And we were like, okay, cool. So Lucky told me, like, you know, who can we get to, to do some designs for us? I go, I got the perfect guy. And I introduced him to Cartoon, and we ended up building this store with uh, with the guy who had these stores on Melrose. And it was called Supermax, and um, that went I for a couple of years, but then the guy who owned the stores, he got funny with us, so we ended up all pulling out of that. And we, we met some, uh, guys in Japan that wanted to take the clothes over there so we started doing orders for them and then uh, we just deaded that company and came out with another one called Not Guilty and ran with uh, Not Guilty for a few years and then when uh, Cartoon was doing a line called Joker with another friend of ours and they they kind of wanted to go their own ways so when at that point not guilty had been we we're go going to court for the name some lady had the name so we uh we we're like you know what we told cartoon our other friend like be real from cypress hill was like hey man i want to get into the clothing game and uh because everlast had been working with the not guilty stuff with me and lucky so when we ended not guilty. B Real was like, Yeah, hey, I want to do some clothing stuff too with you guys. You know, how can I get in? I was like, Well, we should just go get Joker from Cartoon and the other homie, and then, you know, that'll there be our thing. And we bought the rest of the inventory off of them and just ran with that. We had already had the catalogs made, we had some inventory, and we just started pushing that one, took it on tour. I made sure that we, wear, we wore it at every show, every interview. And uh, he was getting in the magazines and, you know, on, on every video, every interview that we were doing. So, you know, we were, we were getting out there. And then every time I would do a photo shoot for like a hip hop magazine, I would bring a box of Joker as a gift for it's like, say, Mob Deep. And I'd be like, hey, homies, you know, welcome to L.A. You know, this is um, this is our clothing brand. And they're like, oh, word, you know. Can we throw it on for the photo shot? I go, yeah, you don't have to, but if you want to, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> right on. So then every time I go shoot, I bring a box for whoever I'm shooting of clothes. Like I took Ice Cube some clothes and he, he wears it, you know, so everybody started wearing the clothes and it just started getting out there through, the, through those channels, you know, and which was like a non-traditional way of a clothing brand starting and getting out there like most people had to pay for advertising and they had to set up photo shoots with models and all that but I was in the hip-hop world already and I knew all these people and then I was shooting for a magazine so I had like the Cypress Hill family you know right as you know coming into the thing so when I yeah, be hey what's up you know to mob deep yeah, hey guys what's up I'm Stephen from Cypress Hill and they're like, oh, okay cool yeah, yeah, that, you know, that's our shit right there. You know, people would automatically, when you were affiliated with Cypress Hill and House of Pain and you're, that's your family, Yeah, you come in with the, you know, arms open, open doors, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So everybody was just wearing our shit just on the strength. And so we had just full, like we could even, we are like, hey, can we put a picture of you in the ad? And they're like, yeah. So then we started advertising. We had all the hottest dudes in the hip-hop game wearing our stuff. And 
it kind of blew up you know it was doing it was doing good it originally started like as a as a chicano latino clothing line but because we were so in deep with the with the hip-hop community and we knew everybody and we were going everywhere and you know i would bring boxes of clothes on tour if we'd be touring with the bands you know i'd be like hey guys you know this is our clothing brand and they're like oh okay yeah so everybody on tour would be wearing it it's just like we had everything just wide open for us and um we did pretty good with that you know we we made some bad decisions with partnering with people that wanted to be involved in the company but on the outside you know as far as what everybody saw we we're killing the game you know yeah, we did some dope trade show parties back in the days, remember? Yeah, we, we did those Payne magic Cypress shows. And yeah. We did a show at the Hard Rock, and it was over, so it was like way too sold out. Yeah. With House of Pain, Crazy Town, and Cypress, or Sugar Ray, or somebody. Yeah, I was like, you know, we were tripping out. Like, I have a picture of that, the, you know, Cypress Hill show by Joker Brand uh -huh. on the marquee at the <clears throat> Hard Rock Hotel. Like I was like, man, we we made it, you know, like, and we weren't even big, you know, like there was like companies like FUBU and Sean John and Rockaway, they were shipping like 300 million a year or something like that. We're like, man, how do they even, where do they come up with these numbers? Like, this is crazy, you know? But then, um, and you know, our company was way, way, way smaller than that, but we felt like we we're we were making it, you know, we were doing big things because we had everybody in our gear. We were doing all the coolest shit. And we we feel like we had the first streetwear brand that was really streetwear, you know. There was like other graffiti wear brands or... They crossed wear. over into surfwear. A friend of ours, pro surfer Ricky, did a thing called Hardware and he took it from Supermax. Yeah. And he actually sold it, made some yeah, money. Yeah, I remember that one. Do you remember Hardware? Yeah, didn't he do like some, some knuckles or something? Yeah, but he did. Yeah. He it was straight off. He bit off of what you guys were doing. He was yeah. a pro surfer, and he created yeah. It's like uh, I think it was called Hardware, and ended up selling off some company in Japan or something like that. Yeah, I think I remember Logo. He had Lokes on when his yeah, fist yeah. was out, and it said Hardware on his or under it or something. Yeah, and like yeah. his whole thing, like uh, those clasps for like you know he had those jackets that looked like almost like the, the metal clasps. And like bulletproof vest. Yeah, or like, like a and, and then jacket. Yeah, and then they were trying to do the thing to where, you know, and they give you the thing from the like, county and has the the thing, like, you know, the jacket they give out or something like that. You had some kind of gimmicky thing going on like that. But it's interesting just because they, it just crossed over into all these yeah. different, like, you know, people biting on to, you know, whatever it going to. Well, I mean, when we were out back in the days, we'd be out with corn, you know, all the blank, you know, and then you'd see those dudes wearing this shit because they wanted to be down yeah. with the culture. So that translates outward, you know, rather than just having Cypress or Cycle Realm or whoever, House of Pain, it was way beyond that. Isn't it trippy though, so when you see some dudes in Tokyo, like with throwing down lowriders, I just look at it and I just kind of, I mean, it's cool, but I just like go, oh, okay. Well, back to that, I mean, he was shooting for Fine Magazine. Yeah, we had a, my first, one of my first jobs was a Japanese magazine and it was, we'd get two pages every month, it was called Fine magazine and and our section was called low life and we get paid like 400 bucks a page every month for two pages me and cartoons so that was like our first one of our first jobs that was like a consistent thing like every month we knew right. we had to do it, it ended up going to four pages because you know they got a good response because the magazine had like all kinds of youth culture and like surf skate punk rock, hip hop, low riding, they, they had everything right. in, in the 90s, in the early 90s. And um, it was a trip that, you know, out of everybody, the magazine that would help, like it's always a trip for us, is like the people that that really push for us in, in that kind of way is not people in LA, from LA. Like the, the first magazine that would give us a shot, they're from Japan. The, the guys that would give us a shot for the documentary, they were in Argentina, you know? Right. Like, why isn't people from, like we had to really like fight to be in magazines in LA, like, you know, almost beg them, you know, like, hey, you know, can you, can we do this or can you do that? And yeah, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll give you a call, you know? Or like people 
for the documentary, like, hey, we have this documentary. Like, yeah, cool. You know, I just don't know how we'd market it or this, that, and the other. Like, how much did you guys want again? You know, like, you know, we want the regular, the regular budget that you give any other documentary. You know, don't you, try and. It's give a perfect us a example of, of his timing again. Because yeah. he was out there going, bam, 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 I need to do this, 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 and, and he couldn't do it. And they said, no, because I'm going to go international. So that international the, like, thing that sent him there is, what, is why everything happened. They had a different, he had a different story going. I'm going to go, like his tentacles went, Phew! you know, because you were thinking in here and here, and you were like, it just went out. Yeah. And due to those things, like, like we had a, up. we yeah. always had, like on our, on our uh, designs, we always put Joker brand worldwide because like, we always had like so much love and response from all around the world. Like we'd go on, on we'd go to shows here in the States and people were like, you know, being cool. They're like, yeah, this is cool. Bobbing their head at the show and you go to another country and they're just losing their mind. Like you go to Latin America and they're like, yeah, they're going, they're going crazy because they don't get to see that shit that often. You know, here it's kind of like, you're z desensitized exactly, to stuff yeah. here because you, yeah, see, you it so see it much. every day. Speaking of that, let's talk about Ireland for a second. Go ahead. Do you remember that? Which which part? So this guy, this we go to Ireland, and uh, Eric had a, a, a family emergency. He had to come back. Everless had to come back to the states. Remember that? The first night we get there, he says, "I got to go back home. There's an emergency." So we have this emergency meeting in the room, and we get on a speakerphone with Happy Walters who you know yeah. shout out to Happy Buzztone and they're like Esteban we need you to to play Everlast and he's like oh, I'm ever I'm not playing Everlast I'll DJ I'm, but I'm not playing Everlast why doesn't Eddie play Everlast do you remember that yeah and he's like it gets quiet in the room and Happy's like Eddie I'm like yeah what's up Happy he's like would you be down to give it a shot? <laughs> I, don't, I don't rap. I mean, I'm not a rapper. I, I can rap along to the song, but I, I've never written rhymes. It's never been something I wanted to do. I kind of got staged, like, I, you know. <laughs> Thanks to this guy, I get faxed a copy of the set list, and we're sharing a room. I'm in the bathroom all night with, at the time, it was a Sony Walkman, Discman, and I'm in the bath bathroom all night re learning the lyrics while he's in there sleeping nice and comfortable because he knows he doesn't have to do it. And we're in Dublin, Ireland. So we go on the next day, and Stevon's DJing. Me, Danny, and Lee are running around up front on stage, and I'm there doing the best I can to recite Eric's lyrics. Oh, you did it? I mean, I had to do it. I was going to get Eric's pay for the night if it, yeah. worked, if it worked out. And uh, it didn't work out. No, say I would say that you don't look like him. Yeah, I don't. He's... Yeah, you it's know. very different. And we're in Dublin. Like, you know, not yeah, in yeah, like yeah. Nashville where it's kind of like <laughs> whatever. <laughs> like, I don't think it would have worked there. So at don't. the end of the show, Danny goes jump in the crowd because every show we went on, I would stage dive. And they moved? Because you know, <laughs> when you're on the road and you're part of the band and you're like, you know, when you jump in, they're like, they love you. Yeah, they yeah, they yeah. talk, bring you out, push yeah. you back in. Not this time. They suck me straight to the floor. And, and him and Tiny... <laughs> Remember, Ti was who was there? No, remember, <laughs> Tiny wasn't. Yeah, was Tiny there? That's funny. Whoever it was, they jump in and they save me. My Jesus piece got snatched. I was completely beat up. And he's laughing the whole time like he is right now. Like, how was that, Eddie Last? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so That's what we called him, Eddie Last. <laughs> that, that night it was, right? That night he's done. Everlast and Eddie Last. Yeah. yeah. This is his stepbrother. We don't have Everlast, but we got Eddie Last. Yeah. I mean, they were literally throwing <laughs> bottles at the stage, though, Joe. Like, we're, we want Eric. We want and bottles. He said, oh, we got his Eddie. <laughs> 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 we got Eddie uh, Last. Yeah, I never got my Jesus piece back, or did I get the pay, but whatever. You know, we did it for the squad. But that was playing a serious trick in Ireland, dude, is actually getting up and putting some half-black dude up on stage and saying, this is Everlast. Well, they called it the House of Pain crew to get away from the <laughs> yeah. House of Pain. You know, we were like, you know. But we were on a plane the next day back home. Yeah, like so we've done shows like that with Cypress too, where, you know, but there's other bands that have done it too, like Pink Floyd's done it, you know, where their their front guy has changed throughout the years. And as long as you're bringing the music and those lyrics and people can, you know, live off, live those memories, yeah, you know, through that, that music that night, most of them are pretty cool with it, you know? 
there's a couple of the diehard fans that'll get burned out, you know, but for the most part, if the same music's playing and you hear those same lyrics and stuff, then and the it's all good, right. yeah. Just pop a few mushrooms or whatever, smoke some weed, and you're there, you know? Yeah, they'll be like, is that Eddie last or Everlast? Yeah. yeah. He's calling for you to drop your arms. Oh. Uh-oh. Sorry. Anyway, what else? Well, that was awesome. Art show. Oh, yeah, let's talk about that. Let's Ready? Let's do it. Can we, we're still going, right? Yeah, we'll edit right into that. So now we're going to jam you up real quick. I think we talked a little bit about it, but I'm not sure if we did. But we're doing a virtual art show that may have a permanent uh, residency in uh, New York. We're working on something with Casey right now, um, Seventh Letter. But we are going to be raising money for mental illness or wellness, however you look at it. Mental health. Which is a cyst. Yeah, and also raising money for addiction, uh, rock to recovery. Guys from uh, he was in corn. He also he was Wes, in head P. Yeah, remember them back in the day. Wes, he's also he was also an alien, uh, alien out farm. He's in a bunch of bands, um, but he has a thing called Rock to Recovery. So we're going to donate some money to that, and then we also are going to donate some money to Native Americans. Um, and whoever's you can pick the 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 you can pick the charity that you want your money to go to or what you want to align with. And we were thinking maybe we could get you to be a part of that. We've had some pro athletes. Uh, this this is Kelly Slater surfboard and Retina painted it. We had one of the uh, Bruce Irons gave us a board. Retina painted it. We gave uh, some money to homeless with that. So we we uh, came up with the idea to bring some other athletes and musicians together to do collaborations and art and to do um, to raise money for these pieces uh, for addiction and for mental health. So. Um, Trying to get Ruka involved. Yeah. Pat. That's good. Bagel's going to donate some prints. Um, we've got a long list of people who have already said yes, but we'd like to get it. You know, I'd love you. to talk to you about is if there's something we could do to help um, raise some money to, do, to put together something to, to put together um, uh, something for kids with photography, something that maybe would be, make it easier on you to say, hey, I would be able to do that to bring it to some kids in the hood, you know what I'm saying? Or in inner city, something like that, you know? What, like a little photographer? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Something like that. I mean, it's really easy to pay for a print and put it in a frame and hopefully they command some money. But both would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is. Whatever you wake up and go, that sounds good to me, is cool. Yeah. If it's none or all the above, it's cool. Because you're here, so that was cool. I always, you know, I've never said no to Eddie once. That's right. You know what might work? I just thought of this, and I appreciate that. Thank you. But maybe we get someone like an at-risk youth from the hood can come out and shadow a day for a photo shoot with this deadline so he's not taking time away from his day, but he's actually bringing someone out to experience, you know, getting see, seeing a music video shot. Or if you tie that to the to the, the documentary, someone see it, and if you use that and say, hey, something you like could that, yeah. sit in, that's where 360 would make sense. Where's he at? Yeah, that, that we could work something we'll out to where we'd be able to raise some money for something you're doing and th- that would help with some of the youth if it was something yeah. that felt, you know, felt right to you. And there's one last thing that we really want to do. Mm-hmm. We want to meditate with you right now. Really? He's going to go kidding. there. <laughs> 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 yeah. He's we like... We want to do some yoga. We want to do some that. Kundalini. Like, <laughs> he wants to get you into some Kundalini classes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Open your chakras, homie. Yeah. You ever do yoga? Mm-hmm. I think I tried it once. Yeah. You should try it. I mean, I don't want to be the pusher here of like, you know, but if, you know, Kundalini saved my life to a certain extent, you know, or at least at this phase of my life. Mm-hmm. He was, the funny thing is that Eddie was the only, the only person that listened. Because imagine being like, I grew up my whole life on the street and being exposed to the way the street is. Yeah. You know, but I woke up, you know, one day and I was tripping and I told my ex-wife, I was like, People that aren't here are speaking to my best friend that used to like run dope everywhere for me, like straight up, like made a movie about it. When Vin yeah. Diesel called a man apart, this cat died and came back and started communicating with me. Now I'm a normal cat, but I was like, something's up here, man. Like, how's this cat communicating with me? Yeah. I was fucking tripping, dude, straight up. So I went to my. To no, because Bally told him to talk to Eddie. Yeah, so the only person, so this dead dude, this guy, friends. dead, he tells me, and I'm really successful. I have got a lot of things. I've acquired a lot. I got convertible Bentleys, hard Bentleys. I'm building $20 million homes. I'm chilling. He's like, go talk to Eddie. 
And I'm like, this is crazy. So I got this dead guy telling me to talk to Eddie. What's Eddie doing? Like, he's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> he's going to get me in trouble. What kind of spirit's coming to me? Yeah. Right? I go to Eddie, but he was the only person that listened to me because my ex that said, oh, he lost his mind. He's crazy. But because of the things that me and Eddie had done when we were younger, he looked me straight in the eyes and he looked at me and he goes, so tell me right now, look at me. And you know, I said, bro, this is fucking happening, man. And he was like, oh, shit. And I go, I ain't kidding. I don't know what to do. Like, she thinks I went crazy. Like, this has happened, right? Like, I'm still fucking me. Yeah, yeah. You know, but and, this is happening. We've never, I, never, I don't know if you really know our story, but I met Joey under some, some very precarious parts, of, you know, weird situation where somebody was going to jack him for a kilo of coke and wanted me to make front him and out so they could make a window. And then we ended up taking the guy on a long ride and letting him out on the side of the freeway. So, like, that was our initial meeting. Kind of like how we got thrown in the hot seat on a different level. We got thrown in the hot seat. And after that, we were just like, we were boys. And I worked for, well, I worked with Joey for, for years. So um, my, yeah, that. so my, my friends, like, that's what I was saying with spirituality. Like, my guys were doing Santeria and fucking doing things for loads to get through. So I was like, that was a trip to me. Because I'd like watch this shit happen. And I'd be like, yeah, whatever. Because I was a surf dude. But I was going down and dealing with some dudes out in, you know, Mexico yeah, like and Arizona. Real shit, like doing real, real shit. You, yeah, like, you know, like real shit. So when this happened, I was like, this, come on, me? They and got the wrong could, guy. <laughs> all I could tell him was you should go to my kundalini teacher and, you know, see what she has to say. I was terrified he was going to go in there and, like, make a fool of everybody and whatever. And, and it went well. And she kind of guided him through the first phase of this awakening that he had or this, this change. But, I mean, the Joey I knew... Esteban wasn't, it was very black and white. You're on time, you're late, you know, you're short, like, you know, there, no, there's no reason why, where, who, I don't care, whatever, where, where is it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so when he looked at me and he was just off, I was like, okay, something's not right, let's get him over there. And he went to Kundalini and then it helped guide him to where he is now. Yeah. But I was a very dollar and cents type of dude, you know? Yeah. Like, like so what I, you know, what kind of like, what I knew about, I knew I didn't want to be on the street anymore, so I started writing about the experiences, and that's what A Man Apart was, and what you're starting Vin Diesel and Lorenz Tate about the Mexican drug cartel. So that was just something that I just started, you know, doodling, and I, I never thought it'd actually get done, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, I got $40 million from New Line to produce the movie, and I was like, oh shit, this is actually going to happen. But, you know, you never really think of any of the things that could happen or people talking to you that aren't here anymore, but it happened in my family. It ended me up in a mental institution. So when I was there, I started seeing that all the people that were communicating with me had died from heroin or drank themselves to death. I got the fucking bad news bearer speaking to me. So I'm trying to, they're like, what's going on? I'm explaining to them. And the more I'm telling them, the more they're thinking I'm crazy. So I was like, this is a fuck, are you kidding me? You just asked me how I feel. Now I told you now they're <laughs> count back from five slow. And I'm like, guys I'm totally fine yeah but due to what I was saying it just freaked them out but also the polarity like if I was like an altar boy before they'd have been like oh it's okay but because of the dynamic that I came from way over that side it was just too hard for them to get they were like no even my wife like like my like my ex-wife's dad was in a witness protection for 30 years like that this wasn't something we didn't have this type of thing that happened so that's why for me and just even rapping with people like you and just it just knowing this balance is here like I'm spiritual so this is you we're all spiritual but we're having a human experience and we're here like the way you find this divine timing you don't realize it but you hit it every time how do you how's that happen it does because you 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 were able to find it navigate through you know so depending on it doesn't really matter where you're from the street up there or wherever it is my whole thing was just finding out how to tap into that, like, call it higher potential source, whatever it is. It makes you kind of either riddle off the most beautiful shots in the world or, you know, pull off 11 world titles if you're Kelly Slater. But it's just exposing and showing other kids that no matter where it is or who you are, that there's these, there's other things that you can do with these um, situations that you've been put in. It's not, it's not a horrible. They look horrible, but it's actually a gift. So that's kind of where you we'll end this going. one, yeah. And I appreciate you coming in. I, I, I almost stopped it earlier because I, I thought you had to be somewhere, so I apologize about that. Yeah.
Uh, you see me, I was like, thank you for coming. He kept talking, like, oh, we're here no, still. I had to break out the Ireland story. No, no, we had to do it. I'm glad we you did. We had to talk about Joker. Um, I just got to go to Mother's studio. Yeah. All right, we'll handle that. Do a video. Mm -hmm. Got a video tomorrow. What are you doing? Who, who are you shooting for? Uh, Rome Streets. It's an uh, artist that he's putting out. I'm going to shoot a video tomorrow. Just low-key, no permits, no... Kind of like just winging it, running around town. But those always work out good because that's how I work the best. Does Labuda, did you know Labuda, did he try to rep you? Is yeah. That, does he now or no? Um, he comes every... Once in a while he has jobs, specific while, jobs. Say like, hey, this guy wants to do you. Can you write a treatment? I'm like, yeah, yeah. No problem, I got you. And then I, I'm not good at writing treatments and I don't know anybody that does them. So I just... Blow it off. Yeah. yeah, I blow it off and I don't hear from him till the next year. And he's like, hey, I got this huge artist. They want you to do the video. I'm like, oh, fuck, really? Okay, cool, let's do it. And then again, I'm at the same place where I'm like oh, okay writing a treatment like I'm more good when I'm just thinking shit yeah. out than writing down stuff and like you know it, I've had to write treatments for videos and stuff like that and we usually got somebody to write my ideas down and then they would elaborate on them you know that that type of language that that's what I would try to do with video the commissioners want to hear because it's almost like legal language you know, like the treatment writing. That'd be a wrap. You know. Well, when that one's done, we'll say goodbye. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Esteban, we want to thank you for coming out. We appreciate your time. Thank you. We want to wish you luck in everything you have coming. And also extend the, the offer to you if you ever want to do some Kundalini yoga, me and Joey. Would love <laughs> no, really. I mean, I'm not, I'm saying if you ever want to come out to the house and meditate, it's a great view. We're here. Yeah. Uh, this is what we do. Yeah. But yeah, meditating too is like, it's like is the same thing when no one's around you and you're taking pictures and like nothing is else is in your head besides you. Like yeah. that's meditating. Like some people, I think that there's so many different types of meditation. Yeah. That people get stuck on. You have to be sitting there going. Blah, blah, blah. It's not. <laughs> but I really want to see him going. Blah, blah, blah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> I have a hard time getting there. Yeah. Sorry. Well, we'll I do. I didn't think ever, bro, with all the dope and all the things I did. And I was like, like people ADD, t you see me, I kind of have a tap or I was the last person I thought that would be able to drop in and meditate. And once I was able to do that, it really, really slowed all these things up and helped me like big time. I didn't think I was able to do it. And once I was able to capture yeah, that got in. time, I was like, oh, damn, this is what this yeah, is. Once you got in, then you can't get miss out. It. Yeah, yeah it's like, can't get out. You, you can't. It's like, it's that. You know, every day you wake up with it, my day ends up better knowing that I connected with that source. Yeah. And and it's just like setting up in the day. I'm going to set up and go, okay, I'm going to set an intention for the day. And go, did, 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 drink my coffee and do the same thing. I'm still dude, right? But I just create that energy around me. No one else sees it, but then they do start to see it. People are like, I want to be around that cat. You got some positive energy. Right. I go, well, you know what I did? I did my did, did, did in the morning. Yeah, Try no, it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yep. They see, you know, he'll be going, did, 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 Try it. No, I'll send you some some easy ones you can do at home by yourself some prosperity mantras and meditations is where that's what kind of got me i was like you mean i can sit on the floor for 11 minutes and money will start falling from the sky Dude, his ass would be <laughs> levitating he'd be like i think i like this you know what's funny I was is like i'm in one of the old dudes that we just interviewed uh was you know he was in prison i think for 11 12 years not kane the other dude he was running dope to, to hawaii and I don't want to say for who, but, you know, Southside, whatever it was, that was his, his area, yeah. you know? And then he, he became a life coach. Like he got into meditation and he was selling dope, got pit, he got, you know, got jammed up with a big one. And I thought it was fascinating that, you know, how he found, he goes, yeah, I had an awakening in prison, you know, but I was so close to all those dudes. They kind of let me out of my situation to kind of, to kind of move find on. this, yeah, yeah, to move on. And I was allowed to, to do it and I was like really and so he became a life coach the other dude that I interviewed he robbed a hundred banks the first bank he robbed was my bank this dude Kane and I was like I gotta I gotta meet this cat right he robbed a hundred banks and then he turned himself in he, he was he wasn't even in trouble he turned himself in he was looking at 150 years and he did it because he was like feeling like he wanted to make a change with his life and he got I think like 10 or 11 years yeah, you know him. does he know Kane 
No, I mean, maybe not. I mean, he just told you you meet 100 people a day on tour, but you know him. He was around all the time. It was 45 Davids. You also know who his driver <laughs> was. Yeah, but he, but, he, but he went and he turned himself in. They gave him like 10 years or something like that, nine years. And he, it, it, interesting enough, he brought the Rev there and they started bringing meditation into the correctional facilities. And I was like, wow, that's pretty dope. Shout out it, to Agape. Yeah, for sure. So I just feel like stuff like that, there, you know, like there's guys that are in there that come out. And I'm not saying don't do this or yes, do this, but just have a choice for somebody that they can make it. You know, like I'll be the guy saying, you shouldn't go do that or you should go do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but here it is. You it's up it to out. you. Yeah. All right. Bada bing. Thanks for coming. Forget about it. Yeah. Essay all day. <laughs> Essay all we day. appreciate you. No Thanks, problem. bro. No problem. All right. Out. Space between. Thank you guys for tuning in. Satnam.